and the stakes surrounding cybersecurity are very, very high. And the cost to New Zealand from cybercrime, and I've seen a variety of different um, costs and estimates, um, ranges anywhere from about 200 million New Zealand dollars to 600 million New Zealand dollars. Um, the cost to the global economy from cybercrime is anywhere up to a trillion US dollars. Um, and a recent survey um, put together by Norton, they estimated that average losses for the SME sector was around 20,000 or 19,000 New Zealand dollars. And that's, that actually coincides very nicely, uh, or correlates very nicely with what we're seeing from a, a claims perspective on, on our cyber insurance policies. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the CERT because, or the Computer Emergency Response Team, because I think Nick will probably um, touch upon, sorry, um, Paul will probably touch upon that. Um, but the CERT recently released its first um, cybersecurity threat landscape in August, and the report stated that there were 364 cy cybersecurity incidents that had been made to the new CERT in, the, in less than the first three months of um, operation with more than 730,000 New, New Zealand dollars of direct financial losses. Um, setting the scene a bit more, um, and touching upon ransomware, uh, according to Symantec, New Zealand was the fourth most targeted country in Asia Pacific from a ransomware perspective. And from an insurance perspective, again, from what we're seeing on our cyber insurance claims, Ransomware attacks to businesses, small or large, and will represent more than 50% of the claims that we're seeing. As the subject matter today's session states, um, we are focusing on a couple of ransomware events, and we've seen two very high-profile global ransomware attacks in the last few months. The first of which was WannaCry, and it was a ransomware campaign that hit computer systems around the world and that happened back in May. Uh, it was one of the largest, um, or thought to be one of the largest global ransomware campaigns to date and targeted systems that were running unpatched Windows uh, or Windows versions. And like any other um, type of ransomware, the, um, it was a malicious type of uh, software that denied or denies users access to files or their own computer system. Now, um, what normally happens in those situations is if they deny them um, the access to their computer system and you normally get a, a message popping up saying if you don't pay X, Y, Z in Bitcoin or dollars, um, we won't release your files. That event had um, wide-reaching impact on businesses around the world. It, it was very um, well reported that the National Health Service in the UK had a major issue. A number of utilities and car manufacturers and telcos across Europe also had a problem. Hot on the heels of that campaign was Not Petcha. Um, and that campaign, which was originally referred to as Petcha, affected a variety of different Microsoft Windows devices globally. Um, the difference to WannaCry was that the ransomware, um, once it got into a single computer within a network, it then went looking for um, other computers within that network to infect them as well. So it's kind of WannaCry on steroids. And that even happened when computers were relatively or almost completely up to date. Um, it impacted a, a broader range of, of businesses globally. Um, companies that reported a problem as a result of NotPetya included uh, global law firm DLA Piper, um, Cadbury's, um, the uh, Russian oil and gas giant Rosneft, Mola Maersk had a very well publicized um, event over a period of few weeks, I think it's still impacting their business, their shipping line. The publishing giant WPP. Um, Russia and Ukraine had a, a high um, level of um, impact. And other victims were spread across a variety of different countries, including United States, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and Poland. So with that kind of uh, backdrop, um, I'm now going to introduce you to my expert panel. Um, they know way, way more about these issues than I do. Um, and I'm honored to be joined by the, this, probably one of the best panels I've ever actually featured um, on. I'm proud to sort of uh, introduce to you our expert panel. So just taking each in turn, at the, at the far end, we've got Carmen Vicilic, who's Managing Director of Data Insight. 
Carmen has over 15 years experience in using data to solve business problems. Um, she's worked with every major New Zealand bank and insurer and several large retail telco media brands and utility providers. Uh, Carmen has a very impressive array of accolades and commendations. I'm not going to listen today because it's a very long list. Uh, then we've got Paul Ash. Paul is director of the National Cyber Policy Office um, within the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. And Paul has led the NCPO since it established in July 2012. The NCPO led and developed and oversees the implementation of New Zealand's cyber security strategy, which was formulated in 2015. And prior to that, or prior to his present role, Paul was a career diplomat across a variety of quite exotic locations overseas. Then we've got Ian, Ian Fletcher, who is consulting partner at Infisec. Um, he's best known for his time as director of the GCSB between 2012 and 2015. Ian has a wide background in economic policy and regulation, as well as international relations and intellectual property. Ian now manages a leading cybersecurity business, as well as a small number of select consulting assignments. Last but not least, we have Nick. Nick Thompson is director of Propello. Nick had worked um, previously in the intelligence and the law enforcement sectors for a number of years, and more recently, he's a co-founder of Propello. And Propello is a continuous fraud monitoring solution which enables organizations to detect fraudulent activity and identify suspicious trends to reduce losses and improve compliance in real time. So, almost enough from me. Um, I'm going to now hand you over to our expert panelists. I've got a, uh, an opening question for each of them. Um, after that, I will um, hand it over to the floor if you guys have got any questions. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to do was, given that back, backdrop, given the cyber risks that we're seeing, given events like WannaCry and Not Petra, I wanted to ask Paul, um, firstly, um, what's the government doing about cyber risk um, with events like WannaCry and Not Petra? What, and what's it, what's it doing from a cyber security perspective? Well, oh, great. Thanks, thanks for that, Ian. And, um, uh, and thanks for the introduction to, to some of the problems we've seen recently. I'm not going to start with those, actually, but start with um, the kinds of settings we've put in place uh, in recent years uh, in government to try and work on um, what is one of the sort of wicked problems of our time. The, the first thing I guess um, important to emphasise is that government actually takes this issue very, very seriously. Um, and it's increasingly investing in cyber security protection and capability as a response. Um, in, in doing so, I think it's important to note that just as we would encourage every business to do, the government views this not fundamentally as a technical problem, uh, but as a matter of risk management, um, prudent, sensible risk management, and I'll come to the opportunity side of that in a moment. Um, first, about managing business risk um, across the economy, but second, managing national security risks. And I guess the challenge for the government is we have to look at this holistically um, for the whole of New Zealand, uh, and then work with a whole range of different sorts of organisations to try and deliver the solutions. Um, it would be, I think, um, um, quite challenging simply to see this as a risk, though. There's actually a significant opportunity uh, in the cyber security environment for New Zealand. Uh, as the threat environment evolves and adapts, um, to, uh, there will be a relatively small number of countries that are well equipped to address cyber problems. And that um, is important for New Zealand. We actually need to be part of that um, relatively small number of countries um, that gets the problem and knows how to manage it. Uh, and therein lies an opportunity for us. And the opportunity really is threefold. First, um, that we have the sort of protection in place that means New Zealand companies can develop, deliver, and drive the kind of intellectual property um, and, and uh, innovation uh, that shifts the economy up um, the productivity and value chain. Um, second, um, off the back of that, that New Zealand is perceived as a safe place um, to invest and do business. And a good indicator of that, for instance, is the, um, the the place we hold in privacy at the moment, where um, the European Union recognises New Zealand <coughs> as an environment where um, EU data can be stored just as if it were in the EU, which opens up a whole pile of business opportunities. We will probably find ourselves before long in the same space with cyber security, um, that we, need to, you know, we, we will need to be recognised as a good place to do business to be 
be able to continue operating in that environment. And look, the third part, um, and we see this with the four uh, other folks sitting up here with me right now, is that cybersecurity is big business in and of itself. Uh, and there's a really good opportunity there. I've spent a lot of time with New Zealand companies. I've seen a lot of the capability offshore. Um, the quality of the, the product that New Zealand is delivering is up there with the best of the best. Um, we have some um, issues about <coughs> scaling and growing that and exporting it, um, but I'm confident we can do some great stuff there. So what's the government doing to help stimulate that? Um, well, we have at the top of, um, across the, all of our work, a national strategy which sees a secure, resilient and prosperous online New Zealand as, as the vision we want to create. We have four areas or goals we're trying to hit in that, cyber resilience, cyber capability, addressing cyber crime, um, and um, international cooperation that will power all of that. Um, and the actions under those goals have to meet four principles um, for, for, for government. The first is that partnerships are essential. Government can't do this work on its own, um, but nor can the private sector. And actually, we're going to have to find new ways to work across uh, the two public and private sectors uh, to make this work, and increasingly outside our own economy with partner countries as well. Uh, that economic growth needs to be enabled by cyber security. We've come a very long way um, from, um, I guess, the place we were when Ian first stepped into the GCSB and I stepped into my job, uh, where generally cyber security was seen as getting in the way of innovation and economic growth, and it was seen as a zero-sum game. You could either do, you could be secure or you could grow. Um, we're at a point now, I think, where good cyber security settings are seen as a critical enabler uh, for economic growth, and that's a positive thing. The third principle is that national security is upheld. Um, cyber security issues have a very corrosive effect um, at a national level, um, and I'll come to that in a moment with some of the incidents. And the fourth, and this is something that's always up in lights, is that human rights are protected online, that New Zealanders uh, are able to enjoy um, privacy, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly online uh, in light of the settings we put in place. That, that's actually translated through into some pretty practical things. Um, in Project Cortex, which some of you may have heard of, uh, really a world-leading um, piece of work um, where government is working directly with the private sector with critical infrastructures and critical economic generators to apply um, a set of targeted cyber security protections, really bringing the best of what government knows through its powers and authorities and through its insights in the classified world and turning that into practical outcomes for um, um, New Zealand organisations. The second, and we've alluded to it, is establishing CERT NZ, so a, a, a front door, basically, um, for organisations to go to when they have a problem, uh, a place that will aggregate information and share the outputs of that, uh, a place that will do um, the work of providing advice to firms on um, the sorts of measures that they recommend to prevent cyber security problems happening, a place that will deliver the kind of international collaboration. Um, certs, you may not be familiar with them, some of you will be, uh, but in effect, they are a bit like the Red Cross of the cyber security world. Um, certs are able to talk to each other, national certs, uh, even in the midst of crises. So, you know, for instance, the Russian and Ukrainian certs talk all the time at the moment, uh, trying to mitigate cyber events. Um, we're also doing quite a lot of work at the moment trying to build the cyber workforce we need. Uh, we are way short of that. But, um, you know, the, report, the, the best indicators are there's probably a one and a half to two million person shortage worldwide in the cybersecurity workforce that will materialise by about 2020. And we're doing a lot of work around making sure we have the international connections that um, um, drive better security in New Zealand. We can have the conversations with those whose act behaviour we find troubling. Uh, we work with those um, closely uh, who support uh, us and we support them. And we're starting to have the discussion um, with economies that are putting in place cyber security measures that are keeping New Zealand firms either out of the market or seeking to expose their data in a way that is um, pretty damaging. That's all great. Sounds like a really good story, right? Um, the big issue, though, is that the cyber threat just keeps evolving. And um, the way our strategy is structured, we actually have an annual update um, process to try and make sure that the actions we are undertaking can <coughs> shift and adapt almost as quickly as the threat. And if we look through the prism, I guess, of WannaCry and not Petcher this year, uh, we've seen a really big shift. Um, we've seen um, some tools come um, into the um, cyber security market, um, the, the crime side of it, that have been used in ways that have been principally destructive. Um, neither WannaCry nor Petcher 
um, and will not patch it, really raised any money. Um, they were about using uh, ransomware in um, ways that were quite damaging and destructive, and certainly not patch it. was very targeted at a, at a set of accounting software updates in the Ukraine. Um, that then had kick-on effects, second and third order effects, right the way through supply chains around the world that none of us perhaps had anticipated, and I suspect um, the makers of that particular piece of malware hadn't really thought very carefully about either. We're also seeing, and I'd add to those, um, a couple of instances of efforts to go right after the supply chain of the internet itself um, in order to capture information. The first of those really was the internet of things being used through the um, Mirai botnet last year to go after the um, Dyne Corporation's um, domain name server functions. Took down a large chunk of the internet for a short time. Uh, was a real wake-up call um, about some of the risks around poor quality IoT. The other thing we've seen this year that is less well known is a thing called Operation Cloud Hopper. And for those who've seen the reporting out of PwC and BAE systems on this, this was a widespread global effort uh, to go after managed service providers, um, the people we all rely on, and to compromise the credentials that they use to support their customers' um, data. The implications of this are really significant, and I think they've largely been missed um, in um, the, the hue and cry around ransomware, mm. but they really do need some thinking about. So beyond that, um, I guess we still need to worry about what a sort of, we might almost call classical cyber threats, um, crime directed at your organisation's compromise, it's still lucrative, um, it's still um, growing. Um, and I guess these, those plus the newer elements are really charging us, um, challenging us to think uh, differently about how we raise the costs for attackers, um, how we deter them by doing so, uh, about how we build better defences using sensing systems, using AI and machine learning, uh, about how we grow domestic capability in New Zealand to make us resilient, and lastly, about how we engage deeply with a, a select group of partners to think about what collective security looks like in this new um, age. So I'll stop right there, but hopefully that's a good snapshot of what we are doing nationally uh, to grapple with some particularly challenging issues. Excellent. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Ian, with, with that, and given your almost unique um, insights, um, given your sort of experience and history, can we actually stop these breaches, stop these events from happening? Is there anything that we can do? Well, thanks, Ian. Look, I think the answer is we can't stop them if, if we go on as we are. Um, we're underestimating the bad guys and we're hoping that existing defences will kind of work if we just try harder. Um, I think it was, uh, it was uh, Einstein who said it's a particular kind of madness to repeat the experiment and expect a different outcome um, and, and we seem to be suffering from that. If we change the, however, if we change the way we think about the bad guys and think about new ways of, of defending ourselves along the lines that Paul's already mentioned, then we've got some prospect. Let me make two points really, Ian. Um, let's think about cyber crime. Why would you advise your children to go into a career in cyber crime? Well, because it's a great business. Think about it. The, the, they borrow other people's technology. Um, uh, they are clever, well organised. They come up with a lot of new ideas. They work flexibly. They offer great career prospects, incredibly good customer um, um, support. Um, their commercial business model innovates all the time um, and they repeatedly show how they can monetize some of the world's least promising data, yours. That's why they steal it. They steal data, like the man who was asked, why do you rob banks? He says, that's where people have the money. These guys steal your data because they can make money out of it. And, and so thinking about how the monetizing of that data works is really important to understanding, and they're not underestimating, the criminal supply chain. And we nearly, we've got to start not thinking about this in terms of just the technology, that's the kind of presenting symptom. We've got to start thinking about what's the supply chain and the business model um, um, underneath it. In addition to all of those reasons why you might want to advise your kids to go into a, a, a life of crime, um, they pay no tax. Uh, they have really curiously effective corporate governance arrangements, um, including some interesting succession planning um, <laughs> approaches, um, and they very rarely take to Twitter to explain themselves. So that's a big plus in my view. If they were, my basic point is if these businesses were legal, you'd want to work for them or you'd want to own their shares. They are disruptive at an economic level, not just a technical level. And we keep thinking about the technology, not the economics. So that's why we underestimate them. On the, my, my other point, and really this builds on, on what, what Paul said, um, 
is really if we keep repeating the defences that we've got, it's very unlikely to change things. Um, patching, conventional antivirus, firewalls, occasional penetration testing, all very worthy, but actually amount to little. 60% or so of, of breaches use insider um, credentials, no malware involved. Um, if we're going to stop, actually stop breaches, we've got to start thinking about the prospective behaviour, not retrospective signatures. We've got to think about continuous monitoring, not occasional testing. We've got to think about machine learning, not human learning, because that way we can begin to think as fast as the, as the bad guys. And we've got to start turning the aggregating power of the cloud to our advantage so we can get as much data together as we can and begin to apply the machine learning to that. That way we can get our speed of defence, our responsiveness of defence, up to a point where people can at least have a prospect of having an answer to the opening question, can we stop breaches happening? The answer moves from no to maybe. And that's a great improvement. Thank you. Excellent. Sir. Thank you, Ian. Um, so, Carmen, uh, what do you think about cyber risk and how it impacts data? That's the first part of my question. And given your experience and vast array of clients, um, what keeps them awake at night, particularly the, the financial institution sector? Um, it's, it's, um, it's really interesting because there's a massive friction going on in the world. If you think about it, and um, Ian just touched on it, that you know the top five most valued businesses in the world are all data businesses. So Amazon, Facebook, Google. Data now is the new denominator. Data has an, a massive value. And um, those businesses that have created value from data are really driving um, the C-suites you know, across every sector to say, well, actually, we need to use data more. Data enables us to deliver customer centricity in a seamless and relevant experience. And that's what our customers expect today. And so there's this massive friction going on to do things more agile, to do things faster, to do digital innovation. Um, and at the same time, um, more data also means if you've got your cyber hat on, more risk and more complexity, um, more regulatory compliance. So there's this massive friction going on that we're seeing for our clients that their top three things, cyber is always in the top three and digital innovation is always in the top three. And if you think about it, um, intrinsically, there's a friction around both of those, um, coupled with the way that we're changing of how we work. So um, this whole flexible workforce, you know, we all can work from home, we've all got laptops. And so it's not just technology, and it's interesting, you know, every speaker so far has said that, um, and I'm glad it's not because I don't really know, it, um, I'm not a deep expert in the technology of cyber, because mostly um, it's, a, it's around investing in a Ferrari and not being able to get the petrol in there or, or drive it out of the garage um, is the problem around actually having resourcing that and having it always on, because it is constantly changing. So, um, you know, what's keeping them awake? Night. It is managing these two frictions that you can't have an inertia. Um, you know, they're actually having to deal with legacy systems um, that you know aren't using the latest technology. Whereas, um, you know, these cyber um, people, you know, they, they don't have those inhibitors. It's all at all. So. Um, it really is going to only grow and increase. Um, I was at a fintech conference in New York in June, and last year when I was there, um, we, no one mentioned cyber, no one mentioned reg tech in the fintech <laughs> space, and this year it's the fastest growing sector. So they're calling it reg tech, and there's all these new um, startups and massive investment in cyber, because it's only going to increase when you think about internet of things and the volume of data that's going to come through. And, and also as consumers, um, the way we've changed the way we live our lives, where you know, we all have one of these in our pocket, and how much information is on this and just how protected is it? Um, so it's not about just technology, it's about an awareness and so a lot of our um Corporates are really grappling with how do they actually restructure their organisation so that they are aware of data, that data has a value and how you use it. Um, on one way, they want to open it up and have self-service and dashboards and everybody wants to see how many customers they have and who they are and what they're doing. And so you're increasing the, the usage of this data um, and that adds tremendous value. But on the other hand, that with that you increase the risk. So you do need to have that awareness and it's a cultural awareness um, around those risks. Um, it still surprises me for smaller businesses where often I'm talking about data strategy uh, at, at more, um, you know, at a, at a conference and um, some businesses go, well, we don't use that, we don't use data and they see data just as a marketing thing. Well, if you have a customer database, you use data. If you have my name and address and I'm your customer and I sit, whether I sit in your financial records, no matter how big or how small you are, um, you know, I think that there's a little bit of naivety and we're still going to see a lot of uh, increases in really smaller businesses businesses and the, the big corporate 
purpose of focusing on this. Um, but those, you know, naivety thinking, well, I've got this little database and um, I'm not using it for marketing, so I don't count. Um, and, and that can really wreck a brand really quickly. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so, Nick, um, can you first explain what, what fraud is and what, what part that has to play in this? And also, can you explain where cybercrime is coming from and what, yep. you, what your opinion is on, in, is on that? Well, I've spent most of my life trying to catch the bad people. And then when you do catch them in the fraud space and put them in front of a judge, it's the most boring thing in the world for the jury to watch. It really is the most confusing thing, just a simple fraud. But the criminals know they can make a lot of money out of that fraud. So fraud is basically the <coughs> false representation of a matter or fact. So they're basically lies, lies on top of lies. And I've interviewed many Nigerian fraudsters that have just kept on lying on top of the lies. But their goal is to steal, and that's what they're trying to do. And they're trying to tell a lie to steal. Now, fraud for any business anywhere in the world is estimated to be about 5% of their income. Now, fraud in that space can be lying on timesheets through to Mighty River Power having an electrical engineer steal 2.4 million by setting up a false company. That's all fraud. So he's, that's where we're in this space. Now in the financial institutions, where the areas that we work in, especially insurance, that fraud can be somewhere on claims of between 10 to 50 percent. So it's massive amounts of your money going out the door. So you guys are the vi you are, don't become a victim, you are, you are the victims, but you make yourself victims by not paying enough attention to fraud. That is the enabler for the cyber crime. <coughs> the costs, I say, are just um, astronomical, and you know, then the, the people know this. Then, when you throw cyber crime into it, you know, being an ex-police officer, some of this tech goes right over my head. I've got no idea. So, how are you guys, as businesses, supposed to be able to fight against that? So, how are you supposed to defend against something you don't even <coughs> understand? So. First of all, you've got the money being taken. Oh, we, the way we do all this, we just make it, add it onto the premium. It's a cost of business. It's shrinkage. Well, that's not the way to do it because what you're doing is effectively enabling yourself to be targeted. And the way they're going to do that now in this day and age, as everyone on this panel said, is through data. So your smart criminals out there um, are sitting around behind computers that are more educated and more agile than anyone else out there in big business. They can move quickly. A lot of people think cybercrime is espionage caused by the Russians or the Chinese. Well, it's not. 80% of cybercrime is done by criminals, highly organized, and it's the largest illegal economy in the world. It gets, on a year, 445 billion. That's the UN's figures on it. 445 billion dollars. So, as Ian says, I'll train my kids up to get involved in that, because the likelihood of them getting court is minimal. You know, I go back quite a few years, 20 years ago to when I was a police officer and I got called to Selfridges and I went to their um, safe deposit box because someone hadn't paid cash to um, renew their license on the safe deposit box. And we opened it up and inside were seven British passports with the same Nigerian guy, just had like a pair of glasses on and different details and £100,000 in cash. And when we looked into it, Every one of those passports was genuine. Back in that day, 20 years ago, you could go on a course in Nigeria on how to defraud the system. All you need to do is go to birth, deaths and marriages then, and if you went to Battersea, I think it was, um, you go down the book of deaths of young children and there's a little black mark next to them. And that means that the fraudster's gone in and they've obtained that person's identity. They then go on and get a driver's license and then they get the passport. When you've got that sort of opportunity, the world's your oyster. So this gentleman, who actually had the audacity to turn up and try and get his $100,000 back, <laughs> we see he got nabbed for the um, humic trafficking and Interpol warrants on him, but he got his $100,000 back, which really did grate me. But, um, <laughs> you know, in this day and age, they're out there now doing this in a technical way, and they do it in such a way. If you go into the dark web, they're trading your information. Yeah. Medical, medical documents are worth um, between 10 and 20 times more than financial information. That's so they can come back into the insurer and start defrauding you again and taking your money out. And, oh, no, we just put that on as our blooming shrinkage, we'll increase the premiums. One of our customers in the travel insurance space, we can save them $5 million a year on fraud that they've missed. When you were onto something, when we went into there and they said, 
Oh, yeah, well, I think we've got an issue, because travel insurance is just a policy, you're policy-centric, yeah. Um, we paid out for 30 iPhones to the same lady over three months. What sort of system <laughs> is that? And the only reason they got caught out of the 400 claims that they handle a day was that one of the claims officers said, didn't I pay this out a couple of weeks ago? And then they had to look, and it took them two days to get the information out of their system to go, so that's how easy it is to steal. And that's where even thinking about it, without going into the dark web, and it's like TripAdvisor, you know, you get your star ratings, yeah, this is a great malware thing. Even the creators of it are ranked, yeah, no, Ian's useless, this Ian's really good, you know, I want to buy his anyway. product. Yeah. And out they go, and they, off they go, and do whatever they want to do, then they obviously get your data. And by having centralised databases, again, you're making it even more easier because there's a single source of truth for them to target, and that's what they're after. They go in, get it out, you guys are all okay, we're just going to add it onto the premium of the blooming us people that pay the bills, and we're all good. So when you look at what fraud is, it's been around, it's probably the second oldest profession in the world, you know, fraudster, the Trojan horse going into Troy, you know, it's all about deception. And that's been going on for years and years and years. It's just that we're giving them the tools and we're not approaching it in the same way to prevent it. Um, so it's moved on quite a lot from the, the, and it's a lot more complicated than the, 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 the email you get from the, the Nigerian bank, and the gentleman asking for... Yeah, but that still goes on details. as well, you know. They've got so many tools in their toolbox. The technologies en enabled them to have that toolbox. You know, they're the most agile thinkers out there. They've got no barriers. They've got no boundaries. The world is their oyster. They can sit there. They go to, they're just like us. They go to work, you know, come home, pick the kids up from school. You know, these people are no different to ourselves. They just think about life in a different way than we do. They're not law-abiding citizens of the world, effectively. So they will use and abuse it and make a lot of money out of it. Um, actually, just touching upon the sort of crime side of it and the, the, the dark net, um, to me, the dark net is, it's quite a, and this, this, is, this is for you, Nick, this is for you, Ian, this is for whoever. Um, it, it's a bit of a mystery. Um, I don't know much about the dark net. Um, I see you in there all the time. <laughs> doesn't know he's lost. <laughs> Shit. <He's> lost. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so moving on. your name anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what is the dark net? Where does it exist? Who is it? Who's running it? I, I, is it? Is it an Amazon? Is it a? Is it a Google? Is it a business? You go first. Yeah, you go. So the way I think about it simply is it's the bit that Google doesn't reach. So it's the bit that certain normal search engines, normal normal kind of making yourself visible on the on the internet, letting the letting the um, the search engines find you and report you and and index you and rank you and all, do all of that stuff that. Um, a, we both need, A, we need, and B, we hate. Um, uh, these are people who are running bits of the internet that they've opted out of that. Uh, they've kept the search engines out, and therefore they can, uh, they can um, communicate with their customers with much greater choice over who they make themselves known to and, uh, and um, what sort of visibility they, they choose um, to have. So it's dark in the sense that we can't see it, um, not in the sense that it can't be seen. Um, and it ranges from um, uh, people who are involved in um, everything from um, the kind of financial fraud we're talking about through to the extreme end of child exploitation and um, human trafficking, where people um, are very interested in not being found, um, through to the kind of online um, marketplaces, you know, the kind of Silk Road kind of thing, where, where actually um, it's not searchable, but it's very well known. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're involved in the kind of um, the non-taxpaying in, um, uh, informal end of the internet economy, then, then, you know, this is the kind of place that you might, you might go to. So it's a, it's a very wide range of um, internet presences and it's kind of only common feature, as far as I'm concerned, is that you can't Google it because they've chosen not to, uh, to go there. Interestingly, though, um, if you turn it round, uh, the BBC recently published a report of an experiment in the UK where people set up an apparently um, um, legitimate business um, uh, uh, website and then watched to see how long it took before the bad guys showed up for a look. Did, did anyone read this? One hour and ten minutes was the time this, this presence was open on the internet before the automatic um, robots from the, the, the criminal world appeared to check the place out. 
Um, if they found a weakness, then the human hackers came back to look. But this, you know, safety, one hour and 10 minutes, which is, you know, inter an interesting insight. If you make yourself open and show yourself, then, you know, and, and you're not protected, you've painted a big target on your chest. Um, and that's the kind of way you'd think about the, the non-dark net as, as being a, a set of illuminated targets. And that's, it's important to think about that too. Okay, excellent. Nick, anything to... Oh, I mean, that. at the end of the day, if you want to invest in tech, see what the criminals are doing, because they're the best beta testers out there. Absolutely. I mean, these guys are early adopters, you know. They're not on the, the old press button phone. They are right up at the front. <laughs> and, you know, they're on Bitcoin, your phone, yeah, blockchain, yeah. they are all over it yeah. like a rash. So if you want to invest in a piece of tech that's going to work, look what the criminals are doing, because they are miles ahead of us. I agree with that. Yeah, it's interesting you, you mentioned the, the BBC um, article uh, when we when we run our sort of quarterly newsletter, we do a, we do some analytics on number of hits on our website and yep. how many people have actually read the article. And and obviously during during the period we we release our our quarterly newsletter, internet traffic goes like that. And we drive yep. we drive a lot of traffic to mm. our to our website. Um, but interestingly, I think it was towards the end of last year, um, the the newsletter that we that we produced then, um, the highest ranked destination city was Saint Petersburg. Traffic went like that, and we're only we're, we're a New Zealand and now Singapore-based insurance entity, and we're getting a lot of interest from people in St. Petersburg. And obviously, around that time, we started receiving a few interesting calls from people and, and what have you. And you paid out on how many iPhones, did you? <laughs> oh yeah, loads. <laughs> there you go. Um, any? We've got about uh, 15 minutes left. Any any questions from the floor? Um, you can I think you can text them, text them through or. Quite, quite a small room if anybody wants Just to shout, really. raise their hand, yeah. shout, shout a, cre a question through. I was going to ask quickly, you mentioned that state sponsored. It's not actually as big a feature as you might suspect. No, that's just usually an excuse by big corporates to go, they've been caught with their pants down. Because yeah. yeah. from a reputational perspective, it's quite nice to say, oh no, that was the Chinese. Yeah. Opposed to, oh no, that is a bunch of 15 year olds sat in Bulgaria. Bulgaria or somewhere doing it, you know, it's sort of, yeah, no, no, it was a state-sponsored thing. Do you find that, Ian? Yeah, look, I think this is, that's completely right. And um, uh, people who are caught, you know, it's interesting that the, the human psychology of internet breaches is a kind of topic that someone will one day write a very good book on because people treat it as a source of embarrassment, so they don't actually want to disclose. So one of the interesting things about building a, an appropriate culture of security in the world of e-commerce and, and, and data is that in a perfect world, you'd want the culture of aviation, where there is a culture of reporting the near miss of when there's an, an incident or an accident, doing a proper investigation, learning the lessons, everybody being told what happened, a kind of no-blame culture where people come forward and say, well, I nearly clicked on that link from that Nigerian da 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 But actually what happens is people are embarrassed. So actually there's a culture of shame yeah. And that actually works against us, mm -hmm. because if there is a culture of shame, then people will not talk, and people will try and conceal uh, incidents, particularly the kind of near, the kind of near, near miss. And that means it's very much harder to get your organisation to a point where it's taking, having the kind of conversations that I'm sure, you know, Paul would want every organisation in the country to be having about security, because actually people won't own up to themselves, to their bosses, to their colleagues, to their team about what's been going on. And, and that, that means that, that what we find in the, in the commercial cyber security world is we end up trying to talk to people literally one at a time. So you can go into an organisation, you can, you, can, you can talk to somebody about what they might do, how they might change the way they think, and then you've got to go and talk to their colleague, and then their colleague's colleague. The, the story doesn't spread as you would want, and that's one of the social issues we as a community need to, to deal with. One of the things that's clear about the criminal world is they talk to each other. One of the reasons they're early adopters and early discarders, actually, mm -hmm. of technology that doesn't work is they say, that was terrible, it didn't work. Yep. And they've gone by... by they're the best gone. collaborative thinkers out yeah, there. Absolutely. They're amazing. And they don't have this shame culture. And, and we cripple ourselves in terms of dealing with the, the world of, of the internet, which confronts everything we believe about location, identity, space, who are we? How many people can I be on, on the internet? Where do people think I actually live? All of those things, we need to have a serious 
national and international um, debate about that, but because every one of us views our experience of the internet as a personal thing that happens in private, then we miss the opportunity to, to get into the collaboration that gives the bad guys this incredible edge that we've just given them. Yeah. And they write yeah. themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, one of the things in that is making sure that we've got the right structures for organisations to do that. So one of the reasons Cert NZ was stood up the way it has been stood up is to make sure that if you want to report, you want to get some support and advice, you're going to a place that doesn't have a regulatory function. It's not going to turn around and say, well, thank you for reporting that. We're going to prosecute you because you should have done this, that and the other. It doesn't have a law enforcement function. It doesn't have an intelligence function. It's there to provide support and advice and it's there to encourage the kind of information sharing uh, that means that your private experience can actually have some learnings gleaned from it, put alongside everyone else's so-called private experience, because actually they're all quite similar, uh, and pull the, pull the pieces out of that that are important to then provide information more widely into the economy. It's, in a sense, a trusted clearinghouse, an aggregator uh, of that experience. Um, and it's actually been quite important um, in most economies to really think quite constructively about how that's done. The flip side of that is the sort of heavy hammer of regulation. And, you know, that's a constant drumbeat we hear. Um, can't we just force everyone to disclose um, what's happening to them? Um, and there's a really uh, big question mark uh, for us as policymakers as to, um, we, we get, you know, it's a bit like eating fast food. Um, it tastes great when you do it, but you have to spend a lot of time on your bicycle uh, taking the consequences off your hips afterwards. Um, the question is, does it actually deliver a long-term nutritional benefit? And there's no really good evidence at the moment that suggests that regulating in this area actually delivers better outcomes um, than trying to um, either on an industry by industry or sector by sector or supply chain by supply chain basis actually build an environment for good information sharing. Uh, but that debate will remain in tension for a while, I have no doubt. Um, the approach we've taken at the moment is to try and construct um, um, safe places for organisations to have those discussions. And if you look at IBM, they released what, seven terabytes of threat <coughs> data to the community and I think, I mean, it, in our world it's called a fusion centre approach mm. whereby you work um, against a common threat and by, the sh by sharing threat data of what's happening in the same way that the criminals are sharing information around how they're going to get in is the way that you're going to move to work at the same speed. But a lot of companies are very, that's commercially sensitive, we're not going to share it and blah, blah, blah. So you go, oh, I've got the intelligence, I'm going to keep it to myself, where really you should be putting that into a pool and, 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 and being able to share that amongst the businesses. This is how we're being attacked. We've been hit. This isn't a competitive advantage. We need to share this event to everyone else to, to stop, stop it. So in New Zealand, you've got things like the Insurance um, Council of New Zealand with the Insurance Claims Register, which is a very basic version of that. But you need to do that on a bigger scale around cyber threats in this country so that we can pull it, all that threat information into one place analyse it, evaluate it, and then pass it back with some sort of direction to the community that have put it in to prevent these things from happening. Because it's exactly what the criminals are doing about the weaknesses that are there. So if you sit there by yourself, oh yes, no, I'm, all by, I'm okay by myself, well, no, I'm all right, here. Jack Attitude won't solve this problem. Can I just chip in with a good example? Yeah. I mean, so NZ is actually establishing a bunch of non-disclosure agreements with companies that have really good threat data um, so that they can provide it into the cert. It can be anonymized, and, and then the, the learnings from that pushed back out to industry, and they'll do that sector by sector. The GCSB is doing some of that as well. If I look at that on a national scale, what we ideally want to deliver is a real-time heat map of what's happening in New Zealand, so that we can then target support. You know, ransomware, for instance. Um, the health sector is a key, key um, victim of that. Um, and that sometimes is um, local or regional um, because they're going after a particular market. Um, you know, we saw um, Russian cyber criminals about three years ago going after the east coast of Australia um, with retirement scams because they knew there were a hell of a lot of people up on the Sunshine Coast who would fall for it. Um, very, very well targeted. If you lift that up into a national, uh, international um, um, piece of work, one of the most exciting things I think we're starting to see is um, major, major commercial organisations stepping away from the information they have as um, their key currency to the tools they have to manage and process that information, the data analytics, the machine learning. Um, my former US colleague, Michael Daniel, will be here next month. He's now the president of a thing called the Cyber Threat Alliance. The Cyber Threat Alliance has um, got eight founding um, companies that have agreed to share all of their threat information and build a common analytics platform that sits over the top of that to mine that for data all the time and to share that across themselves. Now, they've had to 
deal with the free rider problem, and they've had to put some algorithms in that score the information they get. And interestingly, coming to Ian's point, signatures, indicators of compromise, do not score anywhere yeah. nearly as highly as contextual data about what, what, what sectors and other and behaviours are happening. Behavior. Um, but you know, when you see Palo Alto, Cisco, Symantec, McAfee, Fortinet, um, Checkpoint, Rapid7, uh, all agreeing uh, to pull their information in that way, uh, you can see that actually bits of the market are now starting to work in some interesting ways to deliver those trusted clearinghouses of information in just the same way as the cyber criminal networks have done. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. We're really seeing that with um, you know creating Switzerland environments and still you know adhering to data privacy policy, um, but actually creating insights that you just can't see on your own in your own business. And um, it's really basic stuff. But you've only got a part of the puzzle piece. Then actually, when you pull it all together and automate it, and um, you know with the new algorithms um, and machine learning, you know, you're not inhibited by the volume of data. Um, and the insights that pop out are just phenomenal. You know, even on a basic level, um, creating a single um, customer of you and enriching some property data on site at a bank um, and seeing a many to one and a one to many relationship and we started explaining well you could have a many to one because it could be a block of apartments and you've got lots of accounts linked to this um, but then our data said well actually that's a single address it's a house um, they're going no that must be wrong um, and you know <laughs> no we're like we're pretty sure um, and they sent somebody out that afternoon and they had over 50 accounts all linked um, you know in one bank to the single property you know and you know would, would that bank be unique certainly not. Um, so actually, it's it's not complicated, but it's um, it's interesting to see. I guess a little bit how you know many of the New Zealand businesses are still quite immature on this curve of actually leveraging the data that they have to identify the risks as well, um, as opposed to expecting some technology is going to stop some state from you know diving into attack you. There's so many other smaller risks that you know Nick touched on that businesses do um, where they're not using data. I also think that. Um, there are, you can't depend on the regulator to um, put rules in place and think that that's going to save you. I mean, we just talked about the dark web. You're not going to find them. It's actually up to you and up to us as individuals. And we see the same with privacy regulation. You know, can they keep putting new rules in place around the use of data and best practice for privacy? Well, um, you just can't keep up. Um, you know, I remember somebody decided to pull single blonde female from Facebook and link it with Foursquare with APIs and data that's easy to do and create an app that said meet single blonde female out tonight, you know, find where they are geospatially. Well, is that okay? I've got three daughters and my four kids. I don't think so. Is that legal? Yes. The data was open. You shared your location. You shared your, your photo and that you're single on Facebook um, and you didn't have your right privacy settings. So um, I think there's a long way to go as well of consumers and what we're going to see is an increasing awareness that actually my data is an asset for individually and, and I have to be careful what I share. I'm not reading all the T's and C's as to what they're doing with it and who they're sharing it with, but guess what, those guys, um, you know, the example of a business being a target, well actually individuals will be targets as well, um, and then that's, you know, all of you as businesses have customers and it's those individuals that are sharing their data, so I think we're going to see a lot of change in that space. I agree with that. It's the old saying, if it's free on the, on the internet, it's because you're the, you're the product. product. Yeah, that's, and that's you see true. it every day. Yeah. Okay, I think we're, we're, we're almost um, out of time. I've actually got a really good question here, which I'll kind of um, culminate with the sort of closing question um, and it's a question for each one of you um, if you've got a couple of minutes to sort of make some closing comments and I'll start off with Carmen. <laughs> Firstly, um, the question that's been posed from the floor, um, what are the two key things that companies should be doing now to mitigate cyber risk? That's the first part and the second part is how does the future look? Um, two quite different questions. Mm. I think, you know, um, com it comes down to data. So, um, so many businesses actually don't have a, a data map of where is all the data in your business. No, um, and quite often, you know, they don't have a single customer view, so they don't actually have and data's mm. in different silos. And so you might be looking just at your customer database, but actually you've got a financial one, you've got a complaints one, you've got a delivery database. So actually map out all the data in your business and then overlay the technology and then make it a, a cultural awareness so that everybody in your business, not the cyber person or the risk person, it's actually everybody in your organisation needs to be KPI and needs to understand this just like data privacy. Um, what's the future? Um, I do think um, phenomenal change, um, you know, as we continue to see this friction of customer centricity and digitisation, you know, it, is, it means more and more information on the net, so we're leaving a digital footprint behind um, that we'll start to see more data vaults or data privacy, um, you know, ways of actually protecting your information and um, whether it's via blockchain or two-step 
two-step authentication of how you actually share that. And I had an incident the other day. Um, my password expires every month, and we have another brand called Velocity. So I emailed from my Data Insight account in the lounge to my um, guy and said, look, can you reset my Velocity? And he rings me up, and he goes, I can't email you the password. Um, and I'm like, okay, true, true. And he goes, You can't email you? me your request to do so either. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, I'm a CEO. <laughs> and then um, right. I, I was telling him, well, just tell me this. Just do it. And he was like, if you could please just follow the process. Okay. <laughs> so um, it was great to Good. see that we had this yeah. process. Like, and then it turned out he'd actually rang my husband, who works in the business, to make sure that I had been locked out. So we had like this three-step authentication, and we kind of laugh about it. But I thought, well, yeah, well actually, done. he was right. I was yeah. trying to break the process as, well, I'm the, I'm the boss. Just reset my password. Um, and I had to laugh because he said to me, just please follow the process. So um, I think it's going continue, to continue to evolve. Cool. Paul? Uh, the first, I, I would add another uh, of the two things you need to do, and um, that is sit down with your board and have a really serious conversation with them about managing uh, the business risk that comes out of cyber. Um, and I would um, rec highly recommend um, the Institute of Directors Cyber Risk Practice Guide as a place to start with then driving uh, change through your business. Um, and that will include the sorts of tools that um, Carmen's described. Uh, but we have found actually many of the organisations we've seen in New Zealand that have actually managed their risk well have been the ones that have treated it as a business risk, sat down with their board and then started to do those standard things around assessing the risk, treating or mitigating it where they can, transferring it where they can by using um, cyber insurance and, and actually thinking really carefully about that. And actually the last piece, how many of you, uh, and I'll come to this last piece, how many of you are accepting cyber risk right now? Put your hands up if you think you are. All right, so some of you haven't. How many of you have got a smartphone in your pocket? Put your hand yeah. up if you have. That's the right answer to the first question. You're all accepting cyber risk at the moment. If I asked you now to, to tell me um, that you've documented that acceptance of risk and you planned for business continuity when it materialises, how many of you would be able to say yes? Okay, there's the gap. Um, it's, one, it's one that your board will be really interested in. Um, in terms of what the future looks like, I think um, we will be moving into a world where um, getting good advice and getting really, really smart, smart tools that move as fast as the criminals do uh, will be uh, the key for New Zealand as a whole and for your organisations. So, um, Ian, for me, what you should be doing, three, three words beginning with D, diary. It should be top of the list in every meeting. So I used to be responsible for a department that regulated mine safety in, in Queensland for some years, the biggest coal mining province in the world. Um, every meeting of every mining company in Queensland, from team meetings to board meetings, item one was mine safety. Every, every injury incident was reported to me as the chief executive of the, of the regulatory organisation. Um, diary, so it's got to be top of the list. Second, get the best defences. Artificial intelligence, endpoint, monitor, continuous assurance defences. Don't rely on the old stuff. And then finally, back to where we started, data. Turn the prism round, have a conversation that says, why would someone want to steal our stuff? How do I monetize that data? And then why don't you monetize it yourself? I mean, this is a kind of obvious thing. If you could turn it around and go, actually, it's worth a lot more than I thought. Well, why don't you do it, for heaven's sake? And, and then the, the last thing, what's, what does the future look like? Two, two words beginning with E, extinction and exclusion. We're in the middle of one of the biggest mass extinction events in human history. I don't refer to a kind of biodiversity question, but companies are going to go out of business as a result of this in very large numbers. The, res the disruptive reshaping of the world economy will be, will be as significant as, um, uh, as Columbus's uh, voyage to the Americas was in transforming the world economy 500 years ago. Uh, that is the scale of change that, that we face. If you don't want to become extinct, then you need, exactly as Paul said, to think hard because survival of the fittest will come to mean you and me. And finally, exclusion. Where this will lead is governments will get weaker and the best companies will get stronger. Data will become exclusive. It will become encrypted. You need to understand where your business fits in that, in that world and get there first because you won't get there second. Awesome. Thank you. And Nick? Last word, eh? Yeah. yeah go for it, mate. Final, okay. final piece. All right. Going back to my young days as a police officer, yeah. crime prevention starts in the home. Okay, so you've got to prevent this yes. in your businesses. Don't become a victim. You're enabling yourselves to be victims. You're leaving your money on the table. Yep. Don't let them take it away from you. 
Okay, that's one of the first thing. You actually don't lock up your money and don't let them steal it. That's going to happen. Share your threats around cybercrime and bits and pieces. Work collaboratively. You've got to move as fast as the criminals are moving, if not faster. As for the future, look at the criminals. Blockchain. Blockchain is the future. You will be moving. I'm going through an ICO at the moment, so I'm a bit up on blockchain. So I'm doing a little bit of a raise there. Um, but the um, blockchain technology being public, immutably impermanent, it's uh, highly reliable through the crypto wizardy that's around that. I don't fully understand, but I'll try and raise some money <laughs> off of it. And um, the transparency <laughs> around it is, uh, is just amazing. The amount of money going into that, I, I, I see the future will be, you'll be born and the state will put you as a 22-digit hash onto the blockchain and that will become your identity. It can never be changed. It will be so hard for fraudsters to steal your identity when you're on thousands of computers around the world and it's one key that's encrypted that locks it to add the next brick in, oh, I've just bought a car, oh, I've, this is on power, I'm paying my power bills, um, I've got married, I've changed my name. That will be in a publicly available space where you will have control over your data. It won't be held on centralised systems and you won't be able to be hacked. Because at the moment, the problem is everything's in a single source of truth, which yeah. is totally hackable. So you'll become a hash number, unfortunately. But that will be the future on the blockchain. Outstanding. That's optimism for you. That's optimism. Yeah. Well, I think Vision. we're well out of time. Um, and that kind of highlights the, um, I guess, the subject matter itself. It's, it's a fascinating subject. We, we could have been here all day talking about it. I certainly could have done as well. But um, I'd like to thank our amazing <coughs> panel. Um, for their time and also their very valuable insights. So if you'd um, give them a round of applause, that would be brilliant. Just as a final wrap-up, uh, is anybody here more worried now than they were when they came in? Yeah, yeah good me. job <laughs> done. Okay, so without further ado, a huge thank you again to Carmen, Paul, Ian, Nick and Ian. Uh, and I've got a gift for you as you leave. Well done. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.